Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, today, I, I will give a talk, and uh, uh, I must say this talk is mainly about uh, weekly supervised learning rather than deep learning. We just uh, use uh, deep uh, neural network, in your deep neural networks in our experiments. And this is John Walter uh, with Professor uh, Sigama, uh, Doctor Duplessis, and uh, many students in our lab. Uh, we all know that uh, fully surpassed deep learning from big data is successful. However, uh, in, uh, in the, uh, the society, there are many uh, fields where we cannot uh, uh, obtain a lot of uh, uh, label data. And, uh, our goal is to achieve uh, high accuracy with low labeling cost. And uh, this is our ultimate goal. And uh, when we talk about this, maybe naturally you can consider unsurpassed learning. However, in unsupervised learning, because there is no supervision at all, so we must brainstorm some performance measure and derive some learning objective from the performance measure, uh, uh, which is usually not consistent with the goal of uh, supervised learning. In this talk, uh, we will consider uh, some uh, weekly <coughs> supervised learning tasks which can uh, have relatively okay accuracy, but uh, the labeling cost is very low, and the goal is the exact same as supervised learning. So I will apply. Uh, I, I will explain uh, what, what do I mean by weekly supervised learning. Uh, nowadays, there there exist many definitions of weekly supervised learning. Uh, here we define it uh, as a binary and a multi-class classification, such that, uh, firstly, the focus is, stu uh, is still inductive learning, but not transductive. <coughs> And uh, secondly, the performance measure is still the classification error, not uh, other uh, like uh, AUC or FN score. And uh, 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 finally, uh, not all training data are equipped with uh, ordinary labels. Note that uh, the first two items come from supervised learning. Uh, if we follow this definition of weekly, uh, weekly supervised learning, then our goal is exactly the same as supervised learning. And the, uh, the third item is shared uh, by all definition, all possible definitions of weekly supervised learning. And if we consider it in this way, then we can, we can uh, uh, divide uh, uh, existing problem settings in weekly supervised learning into two types. The first type is uh, sam supervised learning. Uh, why? Because in sam supervised learning, we are uh, given some uh, a big labeled data set. We still have a small set of fully labeled uh, training data. And in all other learning problems we consider, there are no such uh, 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 such set for for training. Okay, we know that uh, in any weekly supervised learning task, we must have some kind of unlabeled uh, data. I, I will first uh, explain semi supervised learning. Uh, uh, most, uh, uh, until now, most popular form of uh, learning objectives uh, in semi supervised learning to be minimized uh, is the empirical risk, uh, which consider label data, and uh, the realization, which consider unlabeled data. And uh, the definition of the empirical risk uh, is the uh, same as uh, in supervised learning, just that we don't have uh, that many uh, labeled data. And the regularization is based on, uh, usually based on the local smoothness or robustness, where the robustness can be, uh, for example, against the perturbation uh, or, or around each, uh, each point. For, and uh, there can be, okay, I here by regularization, I don't mean uh, we must uh, use realization in the objective function. We can have some uh, implicit uh, realization, such as uh, the temporal ensemble and the mean teacher uh, from the uh, machine teaching. Uh, and uh, the mean teacher uh, is not uh, the state, uh, state of art method in sample learning. And uh, so we consider like other weekly supervised learning problem settings where we don't have a, a, a small set of fully labeled. Uh, data for training. And uh, here we, 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 we examine the characteristic of labeled data. Uh, in uh, supervised learning, we have a large amount of input and output pairs. If, uh, if we uh, reduce the number of uh, training data, then in supervised learning, uh, the labeled data only differ in scale from the, uh, uh, the scale in uh, supervised learning. But uh, in some more difficult uh, learning problem, they also differ in form. For, for example, in positive unlabeled learning, we want to learn a binary classifier only from positive data and unlabeled the data. There is no negative data at all for training the binary classifier. And uh, we can have some more difficult learning problem where we have no label data at all. And this is called unlabeled unlabeled learning, where the classifier probabilities of two unlabeled data sets can be different and uh, they are known to the, to the learning algorithm. And, uh, 
the only supervision we have are the true class prior probability in test data and the two class prior probabilities in those two unable uh, data sets. In this kind of learning problem, we, ma uh, we have to rewrite the true risk if we still want to uh, follow EIM rather than we brainstorm some uh, uh, ad hoc uh, uh, learning objective. So we have two fundamental questions. The first one is, uh, how can we design unbiased risk estimators for tr uh, uh, that will be used in the empirical risk minimization framework? And the second one is, when deep learning is involved, is this still the right way to go? I, I mean, uh, is unbiased risk estimators still the right way to go? Uh, why I ask these two questions? This is because uh, uh, prior to uh, last uh, prior to last year, people in this uh, in some sense learning believe that uh, unbiased risk estimators are the correct way, uh, are the best learning objective. Uh, okay, before you apply any regulation, of course you can apply uh, like a, a weight decay or dropout, whatever kind of uh, uh, regulation you want to apply to your surprise. To our model when you perform surface learning, and uh, and uh, when people derive unbiased risks, risk estimators in uh, uh, statistical learning, uh, basically the classifier is non-parametric. So people believe that uh, the learning objective is model independent. That means if you want to use linear in input model, it's okay. If you want to use the Gaussian kernel model, it's also okay. And if you want to use like a multilayer perceptual or convolutional neural network, it's also okay. Because when we derive the learning objective as some uh, unbiased risk estimators to be minimized, uh, we, uh, we assume that uh, the classifier is non-parametric. But uh, then we want to answer this question that uh, it is not like that. Okay, then I will, uh, I will show you uh, the, the first question. Uh, in order to, in order to uh, uh, give the, uh, 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 our methodology, I, I use uh, PU learning, positive unlabeled learning as uh, illust illustrating example. First, uh, I will say, uh, the, uh, uh, let, let's see the figure. Uh, the first one is PN learning, or it's uh, surprise learning. Uh, why we call it PN learning? Because we assume that uh, we draw positive data and uh, negative data separately pr uh, from two class conditional pr uh, uh, densities. And uh, we have PNU learning, which is simply a uh, sampling learning. Besides the positive data uh, and the negative data, we have uh, 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 so many uh, unlabeled data. And, uh, but uh, if we remove uh, negative data from the unlabeled data, we, we can reduce PNU learning to PU learning. And, and uh, here, it's very, di it's very difficult, because even so, we may have more positive data than uh, sampling learning, but uh, we, we have no single uh, negative data. However, we still want to identify the correct uh, decision boundary as the purple line. Okay, here is the notation. I, I will briefly go through the notation. We have the random variables, uh, just the input and the output. We have the densities, uh, which uh, where the p of x, y is the underlying drawn density. And then all uh, Densities we draw on the data are derived from this underlying draw density. Like Px is the marginal where we draw unlabeled data. Ppx is the uh, positive class uh, conditional. And Px is the negative class conditional. Uh, in this work, we assume that uh, the class prior probability pi p is known to us. However, in positive unlabeled learning and uh, some other related learning problem, it can be easily estimated uh, from the data. Uh, not for training, but uh, for estimating the uh, class prior probability. And uh, we define EP, uh, EP and uh, EN as the expectations over the positive and the negative class conditional density. And then we have three data sets. Uh, XP and XN are used uh, in PN learning. And uh, XP and XU are used in PO learning. Okay, this is a very brief uh, review of empirical risk minimization in supervised learning. Let G be the decision function and L be a loss function. Uh, this L can be any like, uh, uh, classification calibrated uh, surrogate loss. Then the risk or the true risk or uh, expected risk of the classifier G is defined as the drawn expectation uh, over the underlying drawn density of the loss of the margin. Here, Y times G of X uh, is the margin. And then we can, we can decompose, because, because pi p is known to us, so we can decompose the joint e uh, expectation with two uh, marginal e ex expectation, where uh, pi n is uh, 1 minus pi p. 
Then we have positive data and a negative data at hand. So we can naively approximate the expectations uh, uh, by the empirical average, and then we get the unbiased risk estimator in peer learning. Uh, the second, uh, okay, the first uh, 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 transformation is very important, um, but uh, it will not uh, affect uh, the, uh, the risk estimator so long as we have the same data. It's just uh, another way to express the, the expectation. But after we, can, uh, after we express it in this way, we can have some key observations for PO learning. Because the marginal PX is just uh, the sum of uh, pi P times PP of X uh, and uh, the pi N times PN of X. So by rewriting, we, we, we can also uh, see that uh, the second line holds. Because the expectation is linear in the underlying density where you take the, the expectation. So we, we plug uh, that equation back to the definition of the true risk. And then we will have uh, this equation. The, the risk of G in pure learning can be expressed in this way. And we have P data and U data at hand. So we can indirectly approximate the risk by this equation. And we uh, obtain R hat PU as the unbiased risk estimator in PU learning, okay? And uh, intuitively, uh, what, what does this equation mean? This equation means uh, we regard uh, all unlabeled data as negative data. However, there are a lot of positive data inside the unlabeled data for training. So in order to cancel uh, this bias, we also regard uh, positive data as negative and then we minus this risk uh, for, from, from the risk uh, we want to minimize. Then this is the intuitive explanation of, of the equation. Okay, we in, in fact, uh, before that, uh, we first uh, derive a, a non-convex non special case for PU learning. Uh, if the loss function satisfies this symmetric condition, namely L of t plus uh, L of minus, minus t equals one, then we can derive this uh, in, in this way. Uh, this. So this is a question. Okay. You, you assume you know the, the conditional positive for the positives, right? Uh, uh, pardon? For the PU learning case, uh -huh. you are assuming you know the conditional for the positives. Uh, the, the, the pi P? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you know that? I can, you, you can't. Uh, if, you there know, if you really know this, is there a problem? But why? If you, if you know uh, this, this quantity, you, you normally don't know it. I, I mean, uh, we assume this is known, but it can be estimated from other positive and unlabeled data by many existing methods. Like, uh, okay, in order to estimate this one, you need to, you need to uh, consider some uh, uh, learning from corrupted data, where you corrupted the, the P of X given Y, rather than you corrupted P of uh, Y given X. But there are two kinds of learning from corrupted data. One is learning from noisy label, and one is learning from corrupted data. The, but trust me, there are uh, several methods in like uh, NIPS or SML and uh, some journal uh, by some uh, maybe st statistics. Uh, I'm, I'm actually just asking to what, how strong this assumption is, but it's okay. I, 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 <laughs> I don't have a... Uh, okay. If, if you want to estimate it very accurately, then this, this may be a strong assumption. But uh, uh, experimentally, we ob observe that uh, the ground truth pi p is not uh, the optimal for training the, the binary classifier, binary deep classifier. So if we allow some error in estimating uh, the uh, pi p itself, then, then, then this is not a, a strong uh, assumption. It's uh, very weak. Okay? Okay, then I will continue. Okay, I, I must say, in this field, a lot of people assume that we use zero one loss and derive some unbiased risk estimator. But in order uh, to train the classifier, they, s uh, they plug some surrogate loss into that. Uh, when, uh, we, 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 we argue that this is incorrect. We assume that, uh, uh, we assume that the loss function satisfies uh, some condition which is shared with the zero one loss. And then we derive uh, this unbiased risk estimator. And the examples of the loss function satisfying this uh, also include the ramp loss and the sigmoid loss. So we find a, a convex special case. If, uh, and th this, this condition is more famous. It's called a linear, uh, li uh, linear order condition. 
uh, if l t minus l minus t equals minus t, and if this condition is satisfied, uh, we can derive it uh, in this way. And this is convex in G, and if G is linear in the parameter, uh, the overall optimization is, is convex optimization where we can obtain the globally optimal solution. And the examples of loss functions satisfying this include uh, the square loss, logistic loss, and the double hinge loss, where we can use different op optimizers to solve it. Okay. So I will go to the second part. When deep learning is involved, is this still the right way to go? The answer is no. Let us first consider some thought experiment. Assume the cluster is fairly uh, flexible, such as the deep neural networks. Or you can consider it as any measurable function. And we assume that uh, uh, for any uh, cluster, uh, for any uh, uh, candidate cluster, the true risk is positive. Then consider when deep learning means uh, weakly supervised learning in the three cases. The first one is validation. Uh, it's very simple. Fix G and we sample the data. And with high probability, we'll obtain uh, positive empirical risk. The second one is initialization. This one, we can only experimentally observe this, but uh, not uh, theoretically prove this easily. Say we fix the data, uh, the P data and, uh, and the U data, and then we randomly sample cluster. But still with high probability, we can observe that the empirical risk of the cluster is positive. And the third case is training. This is the most different from the first two cases. We have first the data, and then we minimize the empirical risk. Right? And when we minimize the empirical risk, we, we select uh, some cluster in order to decrease uh, the empirical risk. Then sooner or later, so long as the cluster is flexible enough, we will obtain negative empirical risk. And this negative, negative empirical risk um, uh, must mean overfitting, because we assume that for any cluster, the true risk I is positive. And experimentally, we found that uh, the unbiased risk estimator in pure learning is very nice for training linear in-parameter models, including a linear input model. However, it cannot be used for training even the shallow, shallowest multi-layer perceptron. And uh, for, for example, uh, we can see this figure. This is the uh, training of the standard uh, uh, supervised learning and uh, unbiased pure learning on MNIST data set. We can see that uh, uh, the uh, the test error of supervised learning uh, keeping decre uh, uh, keep decreasing, uh, so maybe it's flat. But uh, for pure learning, in the beginning of, of training, the, the test error dropped very quickly. But uh, immediately after that, uh, it just uh, increased and, and uh, never goes down again. Right? Yeah, and we thought uh, it may be because that uh, uh, the P data is too limited, so uh, unlabeled data cannot help. Then we propose a rescue with neither changing the model or, or labeling more data. Because sometimes we, we want to make, make use of uh, a flexible model, but we, we don't want to pay to, la uh, to label more data. Recall that we have this identity, and we plug this this identity, uh, we plug this equation uh, into the true, true risk uh, to derive the unbiased risk estimator. If we approximate the left hand side uh, as in PN learning, the empirical version uh, is non negative. But if we approximate uh, uh, the right hand side in PN learning, it is not guaranteed that it is non negative. So our idea is just very simple just force it to be non negative. And after we put this max operator, this uh, learning objective is not a pointwise. So we need some trick to train it by uh, SGD. We find uh, after applying the JSON inequality, uh, we find it's safe to minimize uh, the upper bound of, of, of this one, uh, which, is, uh, this, uh, which is just uh, the R2 to PU of G averaged over many batches. And then given the current mini batch, uh, in the training algorithm, if we uh, if we found uh, that part uh, denoted by that uh, is non-negative, then we just uh, fit this mini batch by the standard uh, 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 gradient descent. However, if we found uh, that one uh, is not uh, is negative, then it's a signal that uh, we already overfit uh, the current mini batch. So we we should not uh, fit uh, this mini batch uh, fur further. Uh, we it, so we do we, we do some gradient ascent uh, to like uh, return some model capacity represent, uh, representation power back to the model and let the model to fit some mini batches where the training error is still uh, large. 
in the algorithm, the up updates are done by external SGD uh, like algorithm, for example, the Adam in our experiments. And uh, this is the experiments on, on MNIST uh, data set. Uh, here we want to separate uh, the uh, even digits versus the old digits. And uh, uh, okay, we give very few label data to surpass learning, uh, especially negative data. And uh, peer learning and peer learning share the same number of uh, uh, positive data. And uh, for the unable data, we use all training data. The model is a uh, six-layer multi-layer perception with a uh, ReLU uh, activation and uh, and the batch normalization. We can see that uh, uh, we uh, non-negative pure learning successfully fixed the problem of unbiased pure learning, and uh, it will further perform better than supervised learning if uh, supervised learning has only very few training data. And also, uh, this is the experiment on C510. In this one, we, s we want to separate four classes from uh, six classes uh, because uh, they are they are more different, and uh, the the number of training data are similar to the previous model. And here we use the 13 layer uh, convolutional net network, which is known as the all convolutional net, which is uh, now still one of the best uh, uh, models for C510. If it's uh, supervised learning, and we can we can observe a similar phenomenon that uh, the uh, unbiased pure uh, uh, non-negative pure learning uh, successfully uh, fix unbiased uh, unbiased pure learning and uh, improve uh, further improve the performance on, uh, of supervised learning. Okay, uh, I I give pure learning as an example. However, I, I must say when deep learning meets weakly supervised learning, uh, pure classification is not a, a special case. Uh, in fact, uh, in our lab we have worked on uh, several problem. For example, we have pure learning, uh, but uh, it's not an ERM. Uh, okay, it is ERM, but uh, the risk in R, uh, ERM is replaced by some other criteria like uh, AUC maximization and uh, SMI estimation and maximization. And also, we have uh, learning binary classifier from two data sets, uh, where I mentioned as unable to unable to learning. And also, we can we can learn. We, we can learn a, a better classifier from similarity, uh, pairwise similarity data set and, uh, and uh, unable to data set. Also, uh, uh, this is uh, the last one is related to learning from uh, noisy labels. However, uh, in, in this one, we consider some extreme case of learning from noisy labels. A complementary label specifies which class XI is not from. So the majority of the training data are not clean. The majority of, of the training data are uh, dirty. And uh, we, can, we can also derive unbiased risk estimators uh, for this problem. Nevertheless, we observe, uh, uh, we observe in all these problem settings a uh, similar problem with pure learning. So we guess that uh, uh, so long as if we if we modify the risk, we write the risk uh, by adding some term and uh, subtracting some term, uh, and then there may be some negative partial risk to be minimized. We need some uh, non-negative correction, and uh, this is the last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, do you have any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have a problem like, so in your data site you use for testing and you just, just, you just split it, divide this data site with almost half positive or half negatives. But what if in the cases that uh, there is very few, for example, there is very few negative Okay. And your yes, uh, all in no. Okay. In, in our experiments, uh, pi p is almost uh, half. That that is because uh, in this case the empirical risk minimization. I mean the risk is still a, a good perform performance measure. If pi p is very small, say like a zero point zero one or very large, then we should not consider the risk. We should consider AUC maximization. So it doesn't work. Uh, pardon? Yeah, it doesn't work. So uh, well, 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 what it doesn't work? <laughs> Your method doesn't work if there is very few. Not my method. <laughs> I mean, supervised learning doesn't work. Supervised learning, which minimizes the, the risk, doesn't work. But, okay. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, uh, if you really have some positive and unlabeled data, where you know the, the class prior probability in test data is extremely small or large, then you can try our AOC, uh, AOC magnetization method. We are also working on the deep version of, of, of this, uh, this work. I just want to know if you have tested that. Uh, it's not extremely sp small, like only a hundred to one, like something like that. A hundred positive. Okay, one. okay. Then you can see uh, you can see a, a, a paper called a theoretical comparison of positive unlabeled learning and positive negative learning. Uh, where I, I, I'm the first author published in NIPS 2016. And uh, if if the, the pi is very stream, then it's easier. It's easier. I I, I mean uh, our method work. Just, just, uh, just uh, it depends on your definition <laughs> of, of whether an uh, algorithm work or not. Like the pi is very large, for example, it's 0 0.99, and your label date is actually all positive. So what will happen? Okay, in, in, in that case, you should uh, use uh, like uh, NU learning, mm -hmm. because because in that case, collecting negative data and unlabeled uh, unlabeled uh, data is cheaper. But you don't know. What will happen in your case? Right? So you don't know what is the real the distribution. So oh, I, I I don't understand your point. <laughs> My point is is for different pi you need different methods to specify. Of of course, but in all cases our method must be better than unbiased pure learning. Whether it is is better than supervised learning depends on the number of tr uh, the number of label uh, positive data, negative data, unlabeled data, and uh, the class prior probability. There are four factors. Right. Okay, so we have some th theoretical uh, comparison based on rather bank complexity. It's theoretically guaranteed. Okay, thank you very much. So we can have one more uh, question. Uh, I can just ask like this. Sure. The, the yellow one seems to convert faster than the blue. The yellow is your method, right? Yeah. Do you know the reason why that happens? Ah, uh, uh, to be honest, because we can't in IPOC, but uh, here we have much more data. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 don't, we don't count it uh, as the number of training data we pass. It's in IPOC. But uh, our airport uh, contains much more training data because we use all, all training data as unlabeled data and, uh, and give uh, very few, like uh, uh, 1,000 positive data for training. Okay, thank you very much. So let's thank the speaker again.